how do we use technology as a place that we can create and not just consume? So I love this quote, and people hear me say it often, but I just, there's just, it wraps everything up in how I feel about the way in which technology has become a part of what we do every day. So the computer is incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. Man is incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant, and the marriage of the two is a force beyond calculation. And what that means is, is that there is this great opportunity for us to find a blend between what we do with our human brain and our human power and all the things that we can do with our intelligence and marry that with a computer that doesn't have a brain, <laughs> but we get to tell it and it can also be very powerful in helping us to learn and scale and find great ways to learn. So I love that Leo was, um, I think this is really interesting about, he was an um, economist, a public, ser uh, public servant, and he was also a sculptor. I find that people that are in the arts are also really great in tech, just kind of the way our brains work. So let's talk a little bit about, when we think about academic mastery, what has been put forth uh, over the years about how we have learned and what we have used to learn. One of the first things that we can think about in 19th century learning was the pencil. It was one of the first literary tools that we had available to us that people could use that pencil to take the pencil to paper and start writing and learning and figuring out how to take what was in our brain and put it out on paper, right? We also have had for decades, one of the first ways we ever learned how to learn was through verbal communication and stories. I used the microphone, although many years ago it was just sitting around a campfire most often and telling stories. <clears throat> We've most recently um, had the computer and our tablet to do interaction. But before any of that even started, one of the first big inventions that replaced a way in which we communicate it was there was something called the Pony Express that happened in the 1800s. It was only, a, uh, only in action for about 18 months before the telegraph came into play. And that was a really big break in terms of innovation happening in a way in which we communicated. So before it was a little slower, and then all of a sudden the telegraph made it a little faster. And then there's something called the printing press, which is the one in the very, um, <clears throat> picture in the very bottom. And I bring that up because it essentially revolutioned the way, revolutionized the way in which we entirely receive information. Because you were able to take something that had once just been able to be scribed once and replicate it so more than one person would have access to it. That same, ish, that same concept has happened what we're, what we're calling right now the technological revolution, which is what we're in right now. I want you to think very thoughtfully about over the past let's say maybe 50 or 60 years, and the rate at which technology has changed. There was a period of time where it was a little bit slower. We had the introduction of the mainframe. We had the inter computers used to be the size of a room, and then it went into being personal computers, and personal computers change, and they get smaller and bigger, and then you might remember the great days of the BlackBerry, like totally like yeah it was like amazing right um and then really in about 2006 to on was the invention of the ipod which changed the way in which we took information in and the way we used it i used this example earlier today in thinking about for many many years the way in which we listened to music was through like napster and you would burn that on a cd right and then all of a sudden you had this ipod and you could get anything you wanted very different mindset and thought. It's actually about the same time that Netflix came into being, and we'll talk a little bit more about that another time. But none of these, I mean, all of these ways in which we learn are still relevant and, uh, today. We still need pen and paper. We still need to be able to communicate. We still need to be able to scale information. Technology is just another tool that we can use to help students master what they're learning. So when we think about tech, I want us to think, walk in with a mindset with this, that tech is not bad, all bad. It's about how we use it and how we use the tool to help benefit our students, children, students, community members. So let's talk just a minute about the 10 skills. The Future Workforce put out two years or so before the pandemic. The top 10 here include, one of them is virtual collaboration. And you can think about how much that has become relevant over the past uh, 12 months of the pandemic. But things on here include sense making, new media literacy, 
And what that means by new media literacy is all the different technology and applications that go along with that. We can also make mindset, those of us that are, have maybe aged a few years, um, of a time when there was not Facebook or Instagram. There was a time when like Tumblr was popular, or do y'all remember MySpace from way back in the day, right? Um, think about how much that's changed. Think about cross-cultural competency, cognitive load management, design mindset. Oh, there's this great thing on there that makes me skip a beat called computational thinking. And we think about computational thinking, all we're doing is taking the patterns of how we've thought about solving problems with pen and paper and taking those and applying it to how we solve the problem using technology. So how do we say we want the computer to do this, or we want to do this, and then how can we use the computer to help us make it go faster? A lot of that comes in with like using things like Excel, Microsoft Word. There was a time when we had typewriters. So just thinking about what is in play, we talked a little bit even today about understanding those soft skills and understanding how you can learn and apply um, your soft skills to even these things that we're doing here along with the, the technical piece. So how do we leverage technology so that we can be creators and not just consumers? There is a really bad rap with tech that it's all bad, that screen time is terrible. Granted, you have to have a balance. But what I want us to start thinking about is how are we using screen time to allow our kids to create and not just consume? So taking those pieces and putting them together is how we will increase mastery in our academics. And this is what I want you to think about. We can teach a kid how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. The part that makes technology really powerful is how we take those basic skills and then apply them to something we want to solve a problem. And that part is really cool. So let's demystify a little bit about this whole concept of technology and computer science. So sometimes the words come together in a synonymous uh, framework. You've probably also heard STEM or STEAM, right? There's a lot of words and, and acronyms that get thrown around and about. But the entire field of where technological innovation happens is in a field called computer science. Now, some people may be going, oh, eek, I don't know about all of that, right? I often said the same thing, but I can think back to when I was a teenager, middle schooler, and at the time, I thought that I was going to be a radio DJ. My DJ name was DJ Sharky Sharon. And one day, she might come back out, okay? But when I was doing that, I used to take, I'd have, I had a two cassette player piece, and I would figure out, I'd, prop, I'd build out an algorithm for the songs that I wanted. I made a mixtape. That was when mixtapes were the thing. What kind of songs I wanted, what I wanted to say, and I'd write out my content, all right, using reading, or using my writing. Then I'd take my, I would uh, start my timer, and I would know exactly at the increment where I wanted to stop, record what, this is DJ Sharky Sharon coming to you in the midnight hour, right? Then I'd stop it and I would play my song, right? I did this whole thing. And that actually was thinking about STEAM, STEM, technology, computer science, even at that point. Because using that information and then figuring out the problems and the computational pieces that I had to do to use that boom box, to make it happen, well, that time was very simple, is exactly the same pieces that we use now when I'm trying to figure out how to create and record my podcast on my computer. Not much of a different mindset. So when we start thinking about how we're using technology, how we understand what that entire discipline entails, we cannot not have a conversation about computer science. Everything that we do now, everything we touch, has been developed over time. Your watches, your Fitbits, your phones, your computers, your tablets, everything that we stream on our smart TVs, all of that is computer science. Understanding how algorithms work, which is way in which you, steps you take to solve a problem, all of that is on the back end of what we see visually when we look at a TV or a computer screen. So, what I want us to start, the, the piece that I'm getting at here is that computer science is not something that's off in this far off land. It's exactly what we are engaging in every single day. Zoom, y'all, Zoom. 
Zoom's amazing. But you know where Zoom started? It started like way back when you used to be able to, um, you would plug in and use Skype. You might use Skype before, right? And then that translated into like where you would have FaceTime, where you could record on your phone. I mean, there's all these iterations of being able to uh, communicate in a, in a manner which was online. But Zoom did some amazing work. It's a very simple platform that they put up. Here's one screen, here's another, and they use something called an API that connects them together, which is all it is is taking two applications and pairing them together so that you can see one another. And in doing so, they created a whole new way in which we can communicate. Because at the baseline, that's how we learn. That's a whole mastery. If you can read, write, and think, you are going to be successful. So let's think about how I break down computer science and where we can find our role as parents and community members and as educators to help our students really find their own rhythm and their own mastery in computer science technology. Because technology is innovated within the field of computer science. And there are so many opportunities for our kids to be able to learn and grow in that field and actually be able to find their own role and their own fit. Because they may be, what I'm hoping is, I keep telling my own students, and I'm hoping one day I'll live in their pool house. Just give me a separate drive and I'll, I'll roll in and I'm good. So what is computer science? Um, it has a rap that it's someone sitting behind a computer typing and just coding. And actually, that's not true at all. There is definitely an element where there are hardcore coding situations happening. But the way in which a new innovation comes together has a lot to do with project management, has to do with the, uh, the design, has to do with implementation. It has to do with what we call testing, quality, and assurance. And then it also has to do with how it's going to be deployed. Where is it going to sit? Is it something for your computer? Is it an app? What is it that you're developing? Or a whole new piece of technology. So computer science is not boring. It's a set of beautiful digital art forms that allow you to express your thoughts and feelings while you innovate and provide solutions. You become the creator and not the consumer. So I'm going to talk about a few different ways in which you can help find your student find their own tech genius, find their own way in which they can find, use technology to help them create, which means how do we move a student to mastery? We take what they know and apply it to something they like and love. They will move up the pendulum just like that. Think about, so my younger son is obsessed with dinosaurs. Whatever I can do around dinosaurs, we're in. So we take that love and we've done all kinds of things in creating games and we create imagery all around dinosaurs, and he's learned how to manipulate and use a piece of technology to take his knowledge of a dinosaur to the whole next level. Because at least he, he used to tell me all the names, but he couldn't tell me anything about them. So we learned to use nonfiction to be able to explain that. So that's how we become creators. So let's talk a little bit about the buckets of technology and computer science. So when I break this down into what is it, what, what does it look like to even love or want to use an element of technology within the field. It's four buckets, programming, digital, data, and infrastructure. And the way you think about this is when you get on to, when you think about your everyday life and things that you like to do, what is it you like to do? Do you like to draw? Are you a list maker? Do you like things to work in logical sequence? You like side A to match side B. I learned accounting was my jam. Didn't know it, but I really liked the way that I evened out, right? Do you like to look at numbers and understand how information is coming in? When we think about data, what we're thinking about with data is how we're using information to make decisions. And it's not necessarily, it could be good or bad, but most of the time the way data is supposed to be used is to make decisions to move you forward. And then the last one over there is infrastructure, and I'm gonna break these down a little bit more as well over in the next um, couple of slides. But infrastructure is really the building and the putting together of elements in order to create something new and or put something back together. You know, um, that's kind of an art that I think has been lost a little bit. Um, and it's really, it's really a great piece and something we need in terms of continuing to innovate what types of products um, that we are going to be interacting with. So let's break down just a little bit about what each of these are. So 
each of my buckets, I've got the big buckets, and those are all representative of the, of the field. And then breaking that down even further is logic and sequence, numbers, visual, and tinkering. Can anybody, can y'all kind of place in your brain, are you visually putting them in which bucket you think they go in? Maybe, 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 yes, okay. If not, it's fine, we're gonna talk about them. So, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about programming. Um, have y'all heard the favorite and most exciting word that's been like thrown around? It's called coding, right? And everyone's like, oh my God, I don't know what coding is. Like, it's our, all right, so coding is a part of the overarching element of computer science of programming. Coding is some, what we use as an adjective to describe the type of program we're going to develop. So a coding language, there's lots of coding languages that are going to tell the computer <laughs> to do something. That's the program. So for instance, if you um, uh, are, you're on Zoom right now, but you probably found this through a website or through your email. That is web development. There's a coding language called HTML, which is hypertext markup language, that is used to develop web content <coughs> in JavaScript. There is something called C++ and C Sharp. Those are, those are coding or programming languages that you code C Sharp in order to make something. Mostly C Sharp and C++ are used for application development, so things like games or um, interactive applications that you might bring up on um, your computer device. I'm, I'm trying to think of a really good example off the top of my head. Um, anybody ever use, like if you have internal communications, if you're at your company, you might have a little application that pops up and lives on your desktop where you communicate with people. That is usually developed in something like C Sharp. You have something called Python, which is another type of language that will develop a program to help you analyze data. It'll make games. It will bring in large parts of information. You can even use it um, on the back end of your, web, of your web browsers. My point is, is that thinking about logic and uh, about how to apply or learn what language you like, that might take a little bit of time to explore. But if you really love design and development, you may find you'd like to learn something like HTML. Take that love of design and create the code, find the coding language that matches that, and then you apply it to become even better. Mastery, figuring out what you love and then using the coding language to help you get there. For me, my passion has ended up being in data. And I am not a web developer, and I'm not a gamer, and I'm not an application, an app developer. But I am an expert in learning to code and develop and analyze data for the purpose of helping those people that develop websites and develop applications, because they need that information to know what that looks like. So if you like logic and sequence, you probably would be a pretty good programmer. If you, can, if you really like to write, and you can write a really beautiful sentence, you can write a really great line of code. So that's what um, programming is. If you're into numbers and you have a good sense of how numbers work together to put information, and it doesn't always have to be numerics. It could be something around qualitative information. And you're thinking about, gosh, I really would like to know more about who really likes the color green? Or how many of you like McDonald's cheeseburgers? Um, whatever the, that question might be. That's a really great sense of being able to understand numbers and be able to take data and make sense of it. So if you're learning mathematics in school and you're trying to figure out, well, how am I going to use this? Basic information, basic math can be taken to a whole other level by understanding how to collect and analyze data for a purpose. So if you're in a classroom and you want to know more about what your student's favorite um, ice cream is, or favorite color is, or if you want to know what their favorite basketball team is, you can ask all of that information. Or if you're a student, the one thing that I have found works really beautifully is if you are in Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. I'm going to use Girl Scouts for an example because I did a big project with them a year or so ago. And the high school girls were having a hard time selling cookies, but they didn't know their data. They didn't know what cookies were selling, where they were selling, or what was happening. And as soon as we were able to figure that out, they, create, they, like, uh, they sold out of every cookie they had and then had to order more and then had to put people online for donation. 
because they figured out Thin Mints was the big seller, and then they created an entire marketing or digital plan around that to sell their Thin Mints. Mastery. It's using the computer to take what they're learning and taking that data and taking it to the next level. Basic, uh, it was really just adding, adding and subtracting and doing some division to figure out your average. Okay, um, digital is the next bucket. And if you are really that person that loves to sketch and draw and has a really good sense of design and color, this is a great element to be able to take software that's on the computer and take your art piece to the whole next level. You can use all kinds of programming, which I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes, but you can use um, uh, Adobe Photoshop, you can use Canva, you can use, there's tons of painting apps. Use that to create something that you really love and then take that and sell it. There is a whole market for digital art. It's insane. People populate it on their, back, on their you know, backgrounds and all kinds of things. But the other piece to this is, if you have a really good aesthetic, you're a great what we call UX or UI designer, someone who creates an experience for somebody who's going to be using technology. If you think about like sketching out the visual of what a game looks like, like why do people love X, Y, or Z? Like why do we all still love Mario Brothers? I'm just saying I still love Mario Brothers. <laughs> But there's a great element of the colors and the distinct of how that's being used. And so that's our digital platform. Also, if you're a really good storyteller, it's a great place to use. If you're going to, um, this is where kind of my digital brain goes. I love to talk. <laughs> so, I, and storytelling is a great thing if you want to do podcasting. Podcasting is an incredible way to use your skill set and telling stories and helping others learn by using audio learning. All right, the last one that we have here, and then I'll show some examples and open up for questions, but is tinkering. If you're that person that likes to take things apart and put them back together, this is a great way to take on some technology innovation and think about how you can take something apart and put it back together for something else, right? That's exactly how almost everything we've ever now used in our lives has been invented, right? So tinkering is the infrastructure part, and mostly what I say about that is that that is the main piece of like that computer has been put together by different parts. There's also an infrastructure piece that helps with the network. How do we actually stream using the internet? How do we protect ourselves in cybersecurity? How do we actually create networks that are private and public and share information? How has open source, which is something that we use on the, on the web all the time, become so popular, right? Infrastructure falls within that. But if you're like tinkering with robotics and you like to like throw, change things up and things light up and explode, and like if you, any of those things, you would probably fit really well into doing something with infrastructure. Now, none of these stand alone. You can be in all four buckets. You can be in one bucket. Think about where you fall and what you love to do and start there. For me or for someone else, like for me, it was all about the data. I found it really interesting to take numbers and figure out what to do with them. So I started fiddling around with Excel. It's a great entry point. I also <laughs> pretend that I am a graphic designer. I am not. Just when I wanted to be clear about that. But Canva came across to be able to help people create graphics that can be used. And if you really have an eye for graphics, use it. Create, develop, and share what you have. Because the thing that's so interesting, and someone may see that like me, <laughs> say, hey, can you help me with my graphics, right? Because I don't do those on a regular basis. All right, but here are a couple of resources that you can start thinking about doing. Some of them are unplugged, and then some of them are plugged. And the reason why I did both is using technology comes down to a lot of problem solving and being able to figure out what you want to use it for. So while it's fun to kind of get on and just get lost and play a game or go down the YouTube wormhole or TikTok or whatever, we also have a great opportunity to leverage the way in which technology has been presented to us to really take our learning and our mastery to the next level. So if you like programming, if you think you like that logic and that sequence and how things work, a really low entry point is to use something like Scratch. 
It was developed by a group of engineers at MIT, and it's free. So it's just scratch.mit.edu, and I'll share all these resources with everyone. MIT has a plethora of resources that are available for people that are interested in beginning to know more about how you can develop using technology. The other platform is code.org. It's also a very slow entry point. When you're learning to program, there's two ways you can go about it. You can think about it with blocks, which are just dragging and dropping, and then, or you can do it with syntax, which is actually typing in the words and using brackets and things like that. There's lots of platforms out there that you can, but these are just two easy entry points. If you're interested in learning digital, a couple of things that we did today was even stop motion animation. Everything that happens in the animation world is because of computer science. If you've ever heard the word CGI, computer, graphic, um, computer graphics, what that is is literally a computer creating the actual graphic itself. So like when you see the green screen and all those things happening, all that software. Stop motion animation is a free app that you can download and create your own stories and your own animations just by a click of a button, right? But you're actually learning how to create, write, and understand that story. You can use Canva. The other one that I recommend, I highly recommend, is called Pixlr. It is the free version of um, Photoshop. So if you've got a knack and you're interested in knowing more about design and elements, you can go into Pixlr and start designing. If you're really interested in learning more about data, <laughs> I put this one up there because data has a lot of strategy and understanding. Even though I've played tic-tac-toe, right, or any kind of gaming tournament, any kind of game is a source of data because you're keeping score. And you've got to have a purpose. If I do this, then you have to have an ultimate end. So tic-tac-toe is a really great way to do off-site, but to teach strategy problem solving and to start to keep score. How many times do you do this? And then you begin to start analyzing automatically man, Renee keeps winning. Where is she putting that X and that O, right? And then you can also take that and then ultimately put it up into the programming category and create your own tic-tac-toe game using Scratch. Super fun. The other thing that I put on there, there are two ways in which are really great ways to take, again, that love of understanding. If you love weather, we all are obsessed with weather, FYI. I mean, think about how much time you check you're, um, <laughs> how's it hot's it gonna be? When's it gonna rain? All right, weather is a great way to take a look at data and record it. And you can use just a piece of paper, pen and piece of paper. You can use Google Sheets, you can use Excel, you could use an app, you can create anything you want to, but taking that information then becoming knowledgeable about what are our weather patterns. Instead of someone telling you what they are, how about let's get out there and let's figure it out ourselves, mastery taking basic math and science skills to a whole nother level. The other one that I have is plant a seed. This is something that I've done with my classes quite a bit, where we start at the beginning of a semester and we plant some seeds and we collect data throughout the entire semester. How much water, how much sun, and we learn about the different ways in which um, a plant can grow based on, we start looking at the data. Did it get enough water, did it not? There's also these great, um, water sensors now that you can add in the programming element. You put the water sensor in and you connect it to the infrastructure of a Raspberry Pi and actually write a line of code that will ping your um, phone when it needs to be water, it's, it's too dry. And it's like three lines of code. And you're like, whoa, right? Again, it's that sense of accomplishment. If you want to learn some infrastructure, I have a couple of really great suggestions. The Spiro robot is a little circle robot that is a great way to figure out how to program. Take, it, it's not so much about taking it apart, it's more about using it to build and just kind of discover what a robot does. It's a little mini robot. Let's get coding, excuse me, let's start coding. That is a really, it's a kit, and I think it's a, between about uh, 100, a little under 100 bucks. But in it has all these cool gadgets and gadgets that you can put together and you make things light up and move and Turn around, nothing explodes. But um, you could, I guess, if you wanted to. That's a really, and then the micro bit is another great way to start thinking about taking that infrastructure, it's a little uh, breadboard that you connect to your computer and then you combine the hardware with the software. So thinking about taking something you enjoy, using the computer 
or the technology to help you master it by understanding the concept that the entire field of technology is based around this discipline of computer science, of innovation, of design, of art, of some hardcore engineering, but all of those come together to create really great avenues for learning. And for us as parents and as teachers and community members, we can take some of these pieces and say, gosh, I really see that you really are doing a great job with your drawing. Maybe we can take this to another level by putting it through um, the Pixlr program. And then maybe that would be a cool way to send off to have a t-shirt design made, taking them through those steps.